we don't know what the use cases are yet. Um, the Microsoft HoloLens, um, we didn't actually spend a lot of effort working with Microsoft on this, but they took Maya, our, our media and entertainment software that's used in film and gaming, um, and they built a workflow around how an artist might use a product like HoloLens with a desktop product. So their example was, and there's a YouTube video, you can go watch it later if you're interested, but they basically took a motorcycle that came from the, the, the Maya scene, projected it into an environment, so now we get some augmented reality, and they actually had kind of a heads-up display for being able to edit the geometry with Maya tools. So, you know, very cool, but is an artist gonna stand there and do this all day? Well, a conventional artist does on Canvas, right? So maybe, but we don't know in a digital world, you know, if that's a realistic workflow. Um, and then we have a lot of plug-in developers, and again, you know, that's what my group supports. Um, a good example is the V-Ray renderer is already supporting Oculus directly. So um, we see a lot of the support for Oculus, even though it's, it's a developer kit. So people really want this, so we, we know it's important. So what's the fundamental requirements, though, to get to VR? Um, it's 3D, right? You need to have 3D content to start with. Um, that's the fundamental aspect. So there's many tools out there. There's many formats out there. Um, but bringing that together in an accessible way is the challenge. So what's accessible to everyone, even starting to show up in third world countries now? It's the web, right? So that's our common place of sharing information, bringing things together. So we think that bringing 3D to the web is the next step to kind of making 3D available to, to everyone. And this is where our, our view and data API comes in. So this is kind of our first step into making web services, cloud services available um, in, a, in a 3D way. So today, our, our, the web is pretty flat. Even if you go to a retail site, you know, on Amazon, for example, where they're making millions or billions or whatever dollar signs they're making now, you look at their products and the best kind of description you get is some text and maybe several pictures. Um, you might get a 360 view of something, but it's kind of clunky. So why aren't retailers doing this yet? Um, surely when someone builds a couch that's for mass production, they probably have 3D data during their design process. So why not give that to the retailers and let them show it to the customers? So um, I'm not gonna go through these, um, but I wanted to provide some links. So um, since we're talking about links, I just wanted to make sure um, the Meetup facility allows me to upload a PDF or some document afterwards. So I will take this entire presentation, put it in a PDF so you'll have all the links available to you. Um, and, and this particular page has a lot of creative 3D on the web. We held a, um, a web festival, a 3D web festival in San Francisco back in May. Um, we didn't brand it as Autodesk. We tried to really make it an open, creative thing. We just made, we kind of sponsored it. Um, we had Tony Parisi, who's you know kind of the WebGL guy, um, there to help us judge. And we had submissions from all over the world. And then we brought those people that were in the finalists to San Francisco, and we held it in a theater and showed these sites. And people just loved it. And these are some of the the finalists. Um, the one, if you do take a look at um, the Mountains of Mouthness, is interesting because <laughs> it's a 3D virtual world. It's not that interesting to look at, but there's two mountains that will take live tweets and say them to each other. So if you put a particular tag in your tweet, this thing pulls all the tweets and picks it up and, and will say it. Were these VR or just 3D? Just 3D. So, this is where our, what we call our large model viewer, which is the view part of our view and data API. So let me just show you an example of this. So this is a full 3D model of a, of a Revit. 
um, design. And this particular page gives you a pretty good idea of what you can do with the viewing side of our technology. Okay, and like we were, I was showing in the demo room to a few people, um, this particular ver um, instance of the viewer has been customized so you don't see some of those navigation elements. Um, but you do get the navigation elements for free and the property pages and the different aspects of the user interface for free if you want them. You can turn them on and off. Does it work with one screen? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how do we how do we get 3D on the web? So this is where it becomes a little bit challenging. Um, WebGL finally finally became you know part of the HTML5 specification. There was a lot of people kind of waiting for that to really happen, and it did. <coughs> Thank goodness. Woo! Yeah, I see some <laughs> fans in the back. But if you um, do WebGL, let me just switch over here real quick. So this is just a spinning cube. It's taken from Tony Parisi's documentation tutorial about how to learn WebGL. So I just took that code and I put it into a website and this is static. You can't do anything with it. You know, it's just a spinning cube with some different colors. So how much code does it take to do something like that? The challenge is, is that when we're working in uh, WebGL, You now have to work at a very low level graphics, right? You have to program the faces, the vertices, the shaders. The, you have to really understand graphics programming. And that's fine for some people, and it gives you a lot of power and capability. And those sites from the WebFest, a lot of those were pure WebGL. They probably spent months you know, developing that. But if you want to make 3D on the web easy, you don't want to ask everyone to have to program that geometry. So for that spinning cube, this is the HTML5, and I have approximately 300 or so lines of code, just to get one cube to spin. Okay, And that's all it's doing. No interaction, no mouse clicks, nothing. So that's where the next level comes in. So a library such as 3.js, so now, with less code, you can do more, and it's easier, and it makes a little more sense. So instead of creating um, you know, a box with 12 faces, you know, the, the triangle, two triangles per side, um, you can now just say box geometry. Okay? So it's much easier, but you still have to kind of set up that logic, or you have to use some of their loading mechanisms. Um, which is fine, and if you get what you want out of that, that's also fine. But what I found is that a lot of people who do even the loading, there's things like materials that you have to tweak, and colors, and positioning, and you know, um, uh, inverse normals, and that sort of thing. But even here with 3.js, we're able to shrink down the amount of code to get something that does pretty much the same as the first example. We shrink it down to approximately 80 lines of code. So already we're magnitudes better in how much we have to code and understand about 3D. So we think that you know the 3.js is, is so wildly successful now because this is a good solution. It gives people a lot of ability to customize and do what they want to do. So let me switch back over here. Okay, so, but what about something like this, where you have thousands of parts, you've already got the geometry in a system that you know how to use, and you just want to push it to the web. 
you're probably not going to recode it. You're going to probably use something like a loader in 3.js to get that to work, but you know, you'll still have to fiddle the code. So what we're saying is, you know, when you have geometry needs, but you don't want to spend a lot of time coding, that's where these WebGL-based viewers come into play. So three is a low-level one. You're going to spend some time coding. But there's several on the market now. Um, our competitors are Clever and the Sketchfab company. We see those as the, the ones that are as robust as we are. They have some things that they're doing better. We have some things that we're doing better. So it's probably going to be one of those three. And the nice thing about using a viewer is that finally it becomes easy as long as you have the 3D geometries from somewhere. So in this particular case, if we go back to the sofa example, this is an instance of um, our view and data API, the large model viewer. And the geometry came from TurboSquid. So I didn't have to create anything, and it was free. I just went and found the sofa that looked as close to my bitmap that I could find, and I pulled it down for free, and I sent it through our translation service, and I really didn't do anything else to it. I didn't have to tweak it at all. So if we were to take a look at this code now, using our version of the viewer, but I think the other two are very similar, we now have full 3D content with navigation and everything in less than 60 lines. So it really brings it down. The only thing you have to understand is the specific APIs to make the instance, which JavaScript library to reference, of course, and it's, it, it, it becomes easy. And like I said, you get, you know, this is a default instance, so here we see the view cube. We have the default kind of front, left, side views. Um, we have the uh, explode geometry capabilities, you know, and, and this, is, this is all built in um, with, with no extra coding. You can even structure the data and drill down. So if I want to have um, an assembly, for example, of these components that make up the sofa base, I can organize my geometry before sending it to the viewer in such a way that I now have assemblies. So the sofa base is there, and then these are the components that make up that sofa base. Okay, and it's very visual, you know, things that are not selected or ghosted, so you get a very kind of friendly user environment that your users could use to navigate your geometry. All right, so what is our, our services? So we basically have four components to the services. Um, there's a translation piece, and this is a REST API, and, it, and it's something that you don't have to program. You can actually translate geometry. If you're going to create, let's say, the instance of the sofa, and you're going to do that once, and you only need to worry about it once, and you're going to keep it on the server, then you can do that manually. You can drag and drop it, get it to translation, and you're done. But if you want to allow your users to do it, or maybe someone in-house to batch process a whole bunch of geometry, we have a full REST API that allows you to take the geometry, send it to the server, um, put it into temporary buckets or long-term buckets, however you want to store it, um, tells it when to process, um, you get status back as to how processing is done, um, so you can check the status if you want to check it, you can do progress bars, all that kind of stuff. And that's all done on the server side with REST APIs. The viewing side is the viewer that you embed in whatever uh, you know, client you want. It's HTML5 based, WebGL based, JavaScript. So whatever technology you want, it could be a browser, it could be a mobile application if you wanted it to. Um, and then we also have searching and storage on the back end. And those pieces come from the translation part for free. So, for example, um, the searching is the metadata piece. So when we're translating the geometry, whatever metadata is there, the part numbers, the color, whatever it is that was stored as metadata on that geometry, that's maintained in our, in our view. So the stack, again, is there's a server-side REST API, 
there's the client side JavaScript API, and the you know the fundamental uh, workflow is you know again on the server side you you can just go to our um, our portal you register and create an app. It works very similar to some of the other technology portals where you need to register. So that's that gets you access to the service itself. You'll get an access token. And then through the REST APIs, you'll create a bucket, you'll upload your files, um, you'll request the translation, then you'll access the viewable back from the client, and we provide a full quick start guide. So we've done hackathons with the workshop, and we've had people up and running in you know, 10, 15 minutes. So. And that's the translation piece, and that's kind of optional. Again, you, know, you can do that manually without doing any coding. Um, the client side is even easier because it's JavaScript and a lot of people these days really thrive in that environment. So you reference our JavaScript library um, and our style sheet. You make a div tag and this is what essentially names the viewer instance. So you can have multiple viewer instances on the same page or in the same client um, and reference them through the instance ID. So this div tag just kind of labels it so if you have four different instances that you want to manage, you know how to, to code that. Um, and then we have a token handler, which is something that has to do with uh, the cloud service that you have to get refreshed during the session. And that's just to keep people from running a session in, for an infinite amount of time. Um, there's document properties that you would need to load and then you can access um, from the viewable. And then you create an instance of the viewer, and again, you saw that six, about 60 lines of code is the minimum to get that viewer working in your, in your client. So back to the virtual reality piece. So, you know, of course, Google Cardboard is so accessible. It's essentially free. Um, we bought branded ones, so we can give you one of those if you didn't get one. Um, and, you know, it's just a really cool way to share a VR experience. So. We didn't do anything on the cardboard end custom. Like I said earlier, we just simply used the nightly browser. Um, actually, Chrome supports the, the gyros and the, and the handheld devices too. So you didn't have to, we didn't have to do much other than target those platforms. Um, with the Oculus, it was a little bit more work, and we had to kind of target one browser currently. I don't know if, if Chrome is going there yet or not. I didn't have time to, to check for the latest status. Um, but basically, we use the, the Mozilla VR um, plugin with the Firefox Nightly build, and that provides the Oculus support. Um, and then um, I, I found a third party utility called Joy to Key, which would take the Firefox navigation from the mouse and map it to a joystick controller so you can move back and forth using the joystick. So, you know, real simple, off the shelf kind of components using our viewer to create that VR experience. So if you're interested in this, um, you know, you can go to these sites as entry points, um, and then there's tons and tons of samples now. I think we're up to something like 65 different samples. Um, we're, we're exploring all kinds of different technologies. There's a node.js sample for the REST uh, API testing. Um, there's Angular just to see how it works in an Angular environment. So lots of different samples. Um, if you don't see your technology that you like you know, exhibited in our samples, let us know. And we probably find one of our guys that would be happy to, to write a sample to get you started, too. Um, and then this last link on the bottom, just make a note that the one that starts with the 360, this is the interactive one that you can play with without doing any coding. You basically drop your geometry on a drag and drop pad, it will tell you it's translating. You can wait on that page or you can put your email address in and we'll send you an email and say it's done, give you a link to a default viewer instance and you can go view your own geometry and see how it, how it performs in our viewer. So. And then uh, last but not least, if you really do start digging in, I would suggest taking a look at some of these blog articles um, because that will really guide you through some of the, the issues that, that our guys have run up against. So I hope uh, that was interesting for you.